from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The following are three true ghost stories that were submitted to Lord Halifax. They are all grouped together as haunted rooms. The first one is called The Strangling Woman. And it was a story of a haunted room in Thurstatton, Old Hall in Cheshire. And it is in the first book and is in Lord Halifax's own writing. To his dying day, my old friend, Reginald Easton, the artist, persisted in the truth of the following story. One day he had a letter from some people of the name of Cobb, living at Thurstatton Old Hall, Cheshire, asking him if he would pay them a visit and do miniatures of their children. Having accepted the commission, he traveled down to Cheshire to carry it out. The Cobbs he found were charming people and the children were pretty. The house was so full of company that only one room was available for the accommodation of the artist. Mr. Easton noticed a mysterious sort of mattering pass passing between this host and hostess, of which he caught the words, It cannot be helped, there is no other. He took it that these words referred to the apartment which was being given him and naturally put a rather unfavorable construction on them thinking that possibly the room might be damp. This, however, he was assured was not the case. Shortly after dinner, the household retired to bed. It seemed to Mr. Easton that he had scarcely fallen asleep when he was awakened by a strange intruder in the shape of an elderly lady who stood at the foot of his bed in the full light of the moon. She appeared to be wringing her hands, and her eyes were cast down as though she were searching for something on the floor. Thinking that she was one of the guests who had come to the wrong room, Mr. Easton sat up in his bed and said, I beg your pardon, madam, but you have mistaken your room. His visitor made no reply, but to his great surprise disappeared. If ever there was a ghost, that is one, said Mr. Easton to himself. The next morning at breakfast, the mystery of the conversation the previous night between his host and and hostess was cleared up, when in reply to the usual hope that he had slept well, he gave an account of his midnight visitor. Yes, said Mrs. Cobb, we never use that room if we can avoid doing so, for our friends are sometimes terrified by the apparition of a dreadful woman who committed a murder in that room. She is no ancestor of ours, but came into possession of this property by the murder of the heir to it. He was a child who was the only obstacle to her inheriting the estate. She sent the child's nurse away on a fictitious errand, and during her absence she strangled the heir, but did it so skillfully that no traces of foul play were discernible. Nothing would have been known of the crime if she had not confessed it on her deathbed. The property was then sold, and Mr. Cobb's grandfather bought it. Do you think she will appear again? inquired the artist. Certainly she will, and at about the same time was the reply. At Mr. Easton's request he was furnished with a lamp the light of which was kept as low as possible, and so on the second night he lay down in bed with sketching materials by his side determined to keep awake. Presently the ghost appeared and conducted herself exactly as on the previous night. She must, if capable of surprise, have received a shock when Easton sat up in bed and said, I beg your pardon, madam. I am an artist. Will you allow me to make a sketch of you? I shall then convince skeptics of the truth of... But at that moment the old lady vanished as before. 
Mr. Easton, however, persevered with his portrait, the nightly appearance of the murderess, enabling a retentive memory to produce a fair resemblance of what he solemnly declared to me he had seen on each of the seven nights during which he occupied the haunted room. Mr. Easton lent his drawing of the ghost to Lord Halifax, who copied it. His copy is in the ghost book. The second story is titled, Here I Am Again. A copy of a letter dated July 10th, 1917 from Charles G. S. Esquire to Lord Halifax contained the story. It read, Dear Lord Halifax, I send you here with my plain, unvarnished tale, according to your kind request. I may say in confidence that the house was blank. Deal, but I would rather that my name and the name of the house should not be mentioned in case you care at any time to give publicity to the story. The only tales dealing with ghostly phenomena which seem to me to be of any value are those relating first-hand experiences. All others are so embroidered that the truth of them is merely a matter of surmise. My experience was horrible, so much so that I have vowed never to have anything to do with spiritualism in any shape or form. I want no more materializations, which seem to be the goal of all ardent spiritualists. The house in question is an old Georgian house in Deal. It was built about 1740, and Nelson addressed many of his letters to Lady Hamilton from there, calling it Dear Blank House. My host and I had been yachting together, and on our arrival from the sea unexpectedly found the house full of relations who had come to stay. A bed was arranged for me in a dressing room. On a previous visit, I had heard that the house was haunted, and that all the daughters had seen the figure of someone they called their great-grandmother gliding about. The servants had been terrified, and in consequence of what they saw had refused to stay. I had forgotten this. I was in rude health after my channel cruise, and nothing ghostly was discussed before I retired to bed. In the middle of the night, I awoke, feeling that something uncanny was about me. Suddenly there appeared at my bedside the phantom of either an old man or woman of dreadful aspect who was bending over me. That I was wide awake is beyond all question. I at once became cataleptic. Unable to move hand or foot, I could only gaze at this monstrosity, vowing mentally that if I ever recovered from this horrible experience, I would never dabble in table-turning planchette etc again for here was the real materialization and the reality was too terrifying for description next morning i told my host privately of what had occurred he said he was not in the least surprised as everybody living in the house except himself had at one time or another seen something of the sort twenty years passed and I had almost forgotten the incident I had frequently revisited the house and had seen nothing. Then one day I was again invited and found my host alone. We played billiards and retired rather late. I was suffering from toothache and on getting into bed was utterly unable to sleep. The room was in a different part of the house from the dressing room in which I had slept on the occasion of my first visit. Suddenly, although it was early summer, I began to feel very cold. I seemed literally to freeze from my feet upwards, and although I put on more clothes, the cold rapidly increased, until I imagined that my heart must be failing, and that this was death. All at once a voice, unheard physically, appeared to be saying over and over again to me, Here I am again, here I am again, after twenty years. Once more, in an exact repetition of my feeling twenty years before, I was conscious of the presence of something unseen in the room. I pulled myself together and said to myself, This time I will see this thing through and definitely prove 
whether my former experience was a hallucination and whether there really is such a thing as a ghost. I am wide awake beyond all possibility of doubt and only too conscious of a raging toothache. The thing again spoke to me mentally. Look round, look round. I now had that unaccountable feeling of horror which all accounts of such manifestations agree in declaring are produced on such occasions. Turning round, I saw in the corner of the room facing me a curious column of light, revolving spirally like a whirlwind of dust on a windy day. It was white, and as I gazed it slowly drew near to me. Here I am again, the thing kept repeating. I stretched out my hand for the matches at my bedside. As the thing got gradually closer and closer to me, it rapidly began to take human shape. Under my eyes and within my grasp, it assumed that very figure I had seen twenty years before. There was no doubt whatever about this, and having reached the limit of my endurance, I shouted out, Who's that? No answer coming. I hurriedly struck a match and lit a candle. Next morning, I told my host what had befallen me. He was greatly interested and related two weird occurrences in the house, both of which had taken place during the three weeks previous to my visit. On the first occasion, he was in his dressing room when a servant came up to say that a friend had called to see him. He ran hurriedly downstairs, and as he turned on the landing for the next flight, he saw the figure of a man rushing upstairs. My friend, unable to stop himself, put up his hands to avert a collision and went right through the figure. The second occasion had been when one evening an officer of Marines came to pay, play billiards with him and brought his dog, which lay down under the table. Suddenly the dog sprang up and began barking furiously at something invisible in the corner. It went on barking till its mouth foamed and its hair stood on end. They endeavored in vain to calm it. From under the table it kept making violent rushes at the corner and then retreating again. Neither my friend nor the officer who was visiting him saw anything. The third story is titled Head of a Child. The story was sent to Lord Halifax by Lady Margaret Shelley daughter of the first Earl of Idesley. Lady Margaret herself had a collection of stories of this nature. Sir Charles and Lady Hobhouse were giving a party at their place, Monkton Farley, and Miss May Hobhouse was taking, talking to one of the visitors who said, I've had a strange and ghostly experience once in my lifetime. It happened when my mother, my little sister and I, were all staying at Sutton Verney. As the house was very full, my hostess asked me if I would mind having my little sister to sleep in my room. In the middle of the night, I woke up with a distinct feeling that a child's head was resting on my shoulder. I said, as I thought to my sister, Maudie, why have you come into my bed? There was no answer, and struck I a light, and on looking, saw that my sister was fast asleep in her cot beside me. Presently I dropped off to sleep again, only to wake up once more with exactly the same feeling, but when I put out my hand there was no child's head on my shoulder. After this I could not sleep, and on the following day related my experience to my hostess. When the same feeling came over me the next night, I began to feel very nervous. And for the rest of my stay, to my great relief, I was given another room in which I had a peaceful night. As the girl was telling her story to Miss Hobhouse, another guest, Mrs. L., came up and said, I know you are talking of Sutton Vernay. We bought the place, and that room became such a difficulty that at last we pulled down the wing in which it was situated. When the men broke up the floor, they discovered a cavity in which were the skeletons of five children.